Good afternoon, Dr. Charu. We can see you. I hope you can. Yeah. And I can't see you guys. Sir. Yes. Yes. We just. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you are, Sonali. How are you? Good, good to see you. And <laughs> good to see you. Yeah, all, yeah. all good. And yeah, so all set. Uh, you're all right. And uh, ADG, sir, we can. Yeah. If you're connected, sir. Yes. Yeah. Sir, good afternoon, sir. I think we are all connected and uh, we should, should we begin? Yeah, yeah. Surely. Okay. Right, sir. Okay. So, yes. So, general housekeeping, I'll uh, just be moderating. We have uh, ADD, sir, first, and then we have the short video of Dr. George Schaller. Then uh, we have uh, Charu and we have Dr. Ranjani. And uh, if there are questions, they are in the end. But having said that, it's a one hour and it's live on the YouTube. So, uh, that's, that's good. And you all are doing your uh, own slide. Uh, so you're sharing it from there. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sonali. Right. Thanks. OK. Right. Sir. Should we start, Sonali? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am uh, just introducing, sir. And then, sir. Please, please. please. Right, sir. OK. Good afternoon. Namaste. Uh, on the occasion of the eve of the International Slow Leopard today, we have all gathered to celebrate one of the most iconic and charismatic species of the high Himalayas, the snow leopard, <coughs> and the associated species and its habitat. Uh, it is a large cat species native to the mountain ranges of Central and South Asia, and it is, uh, uh, its range is across uh, 12 countries ranging from Russia to India, Nepal, Bhutan, and China. India has been, the government of India has launched the project Snow Leopard to safeguard and conserve India's unique natural heritage of high altitude wildlife populations and habitats. And today, as part of this outreach initiative, we bring to you a series dedicated to the conservation of snow leopard, its associated species and habitat. I welcome you all to the first of the webinar series and to, uh, for, for the opening remarks, I now request and invite Sri Somitra Das Gupta, sir, who is the Additional Director General of Forest, Wildlife, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, for his opening remarks. Sir is an Indian Forest Service officer from uh, West Bengal, Kada, and has been the pioneer and the, uh, and the guiding force to lead the snow leopard conservation in India. Over to you, sir, for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Sonali. So once again, I take the opportunity of welcoming uh, Charu, uh, Ranjani Morali, and all others who may be connected with today's program. So uh, today is a wonderful day. In fact, uh, you know, in the ministry, we are trying to celebrate uh, the uh, species starting from tiger, elephant, uh, lion, and so on and so forth. So this is also a sort of giving Philip to the uh, conservation of, of the species, uh, you know, and help overall in the wildlife conservation in the process. And uh, we have been doing such kind of program sporadically in the past but we thought that we should galvanize all our efforts and processes and start celebrating uh, centrally from the ministry. And uh, we also thank all our partners, uh, collaborators who are with us uh, for all these series of programs that we have organized and for today's program also. And I have been told uh, by the dynamic lady, uh, Sonali Ghosh, that she has planned a series of program for or rather webinar in connection with Snow Leopard Day. So as you all know that Snow Leopard Day will be celebrated tomorrow and tomorrow we have also lined up a very important program comprising of uh, different officials, scientists, and uh, also a few ministerial representations. So we are also uh, waiting for a very fruitful and meaningful outcome from tomorrow's meeting. 
So as far as uh, uh, today's webinar is concerned, I just wanted to brief for all of us uh, who are present today is that uh, the Art Ministry is uh, taking a lot of interest in uh, many, many species and snow leopard is one of them. And, uh, you know, the ministry has already launched the project Snow Leopard in uh, 2009, and uh, which envisaged not only the conservation of the species, but also conservation of the landscape wherein the species is found. And uh, because uh, most of these landscapes are located in the remote areas, uh, it is very important for all of us uh, is so that we should, you know, uh, unify all our efforts and uh, processes in order to uh, implement whatever we plan for uh, such remote landscapes. And uh, uh, right now, uh, as you all know, who are uh, from our country, that snow leopard is found in uh, five uh, states. Uh, that includes uh, uh, the erstwhile Jammu and Kashmir, and uh, now presently the Ladakh Union territories. And uh, we have taken up uh, on a mission mode in reviving the project Snow Leopard, which was perhaps, uh, you know, lagging a little bit behind as far as its implementation is concerned. And, uh, uh, you know, just a year back, we have uh, revived the uh, steering committee and we have all requested the concerning chief wildlife warden of all these states and union territories to come forward so that uh, we have a common platform for conservation of these species. And uh, as I was telling you that the earlier project was uh, catering to the landscape model of conservation and uh, uh, you know, climate smart livelihood enterprises were also being thought of for the people who are uh, residing in this area. We wanted, because these are the areas where you have in a multi-sectoral participation, you know, there are a number of departments, number of ministries, who actually play an important role in this particular area, starting from defense, we have tourism, rural development. So we wanted to have a multi-stakeholder participation while implementation of the project. And uh, as the government of India believes and propagates is that we now want the people to be with us. Uh, so in the same uh, vein, we wanted to take forward the snow leopard conservation along with the participation of the people who are residing either in the area where the snow leopard are found or at least in the vicinity where these protected area are located. And uh, in fact, uh, while doing so, uh, we have recently in 2019, uh, in order to unify all our efforts and processes, we have released a countrywide snow leopard conservation protocol. And that is, uh, that has also spelled out as to how we will be now doing the snow leopard enumeration in the country and laid out details and discuss the matter in detail with the State Chief Wildlife Warden. And I am uh, pretty sure that the process will start. This has already started. The theoretical uh, issue has already been taken over by WII. And we want the practical part to be implemented from uh, the coming uh, 2021. We wanted to start it this year only, but due to this challenging time of COVID, we could not start it. And uh, let me also tell you that uh, the ministry, because it gives a uh, you know, very high weightage for conservation of snow leopard due to its location, the landscape, and uh, being one, we call it as a water tower, the Himalayan region, the water tower. This is very important for the, uh, the well-being of the human being itself. And uh, that's why we also enter into a collaboration with the uh, UNDP and released uh, the uh, Secure Himalayas project which was issued in the year 2017. It's a Jeff project. And herein also, we, uh, we wanted to have the landscape-based level, uh, level management strategies and plans to be, to be uh, you know, taken over from the Project Snow Leopard. We also linked uh, conservation with livelihood, which was very, very important because as I was telling you that the ministry is of conviction that we can't uh, protect the, the species or the landscape in isolation. We have to have the people by our side. And uh, through this project of Secure Himalayas, we were also uh, trying to mitigate the human uh, wildlife conflicts and illegal trade that happens in these areas, not only snow leopard, but for other species as well. We also wanted to uh, strengthen the communication strategy and the knowledge management system through this secure Himalayas process. 
And we felt while implementing uh, the Project Snow Leopard from 2009 that there, being a remote area, uh, the number of uh, human, human resources available for the conservation uh, is far less than what was required. And perhaps the capacity of the staff, even if they are present in these remote areas, were also far uh, below the expected level. So in the Secure Himalayas project, we have a specific uh, chapter for capacity building and policy issues of these locals who are residing in those areas, uh, which included the cross-cutting thing across the components which uh, I was discussing. And in fact, uh, the Secure Himalayas project is uh, going on now in full swing. And some of the states have uh, uh, done it in a very commendably. Some of the states are slightly behind, mainly because uh, in the case of Jammu and Kashmir, the state uh, is now known to be two union territories. So their administrative processes are being finalized. And that's how I think uh, Jammu and Kashmir is lagging slightly behind in comparison to other states. But I'm sure with the industrious nature of the officials and staffs, and also the present administrative structure of Ladakh and uh, Jammu and Kashmir, I'm sure they will catch up with the pace uh, of the other states. So, you know, all in all, we feel that uh, snow leopard is a very important species and uh, uh, the government of India is also thinking of, uh, you know, creating some sort of a platform, a common platform wherein we can address the snow leopard issue just in the lines of Project Tiger and Project Elephant. And uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, submitted a proposal for creation of that platform in one of the most eminent institute of the country, the Wildlife Institute of India. And again, uh, we have been pushed back a little bit by the this COVID, but I'm sure the process of creating that common platform will be taken to its logical conclusion very soon. And uh, you may be knowing all of us who are participating today that uh, India had been the host of the CMS uh, COP and also the UNCCD COP. And uh, naturally, we are the COP presidents for both the CCD as well as the CMS. That actually um, gives a lot of challenge uh, for the government of India in taking forward the wildlife conservation, especially the uh, you know, migratory species. And uh, while the challenge, along with the challenge, I would say there's a lot of opportunity uh, to showcase what we have been doing uh, in the past and what we are planning to do in the future. And naturally, uh, there's another thing which uh, the CMS fraternity has bestowed upon the government of India is the role of the chairman of the standing committee for the next three years. That is also a huge and decisive responsibility that has been best out on government of India. And in that count also, it is very uh, important for all of us to undertake, you know, uh, wildlife conservation, especially the migratory species wildlife conservation in the future. And uh, snow leopard is also a part of the CMS. Let me also clarify this. And uh, it is also a part of the Central Asian Mammal Initiative, CAMI, which is also a subset of the CMS. And uh, we, uh, we are also actually trying to take forward uh, the issues of CAMI, the Central Asian Mammal Initiative. And uh, snow leopard is one such species that we are trying to uh, project as the focused species, uh, along with two or three other species, uh, so that we can take it forward and take along with uh, some of the countries who are yet to be the CMS uh, parties, like Nepal, uh, like Bhutan, now we are trying to get across to these countries so as to have this, you know, transboundary matters sorted out. And uh, uh, let me also uh, tell you and take this opportunity of informing all of you that India is also pursuing this uh, issue of transboundary cooperation through creation of transboundary protected area. And uh, snow leopard uh, can also be one of the species uh, or to, uh, to help us in galvanizing our processes with other countries and take forward this transboundary protected area. Elephant is one of them, tiger is one of them, and uh, some uh, aquatic species along with Sri Lanka we are also planning. But for you know, higher altitudinal uh, uh, species like snow leopard, we can, take, we can take this issue up with Bhutan and Nepal and create uh, you know, transboundary protected areas. So this will eventually actually help us not only the species conservation, but through the species conservation, you know, this will usher in a new era of uh, relationships between the countries who are located uh, very close to each other. 
and these animals can play uh, you know a sort of uh, you know they can pilot us uh, and uh, create the relationship or build the relationship which perhaps is the requirement for a beautiful and green planet to exist and uh, that is all i wanted to share and uh, i will be eagerly listening to all of you today and uh, if there are any questions i will be there uh, for i am told that i have to be here for one hour i will really try to invest one hour and uh, i will i am eager to listen to all of you thank you thank you uh, for listening to me very very patiently thanks all of you thank you thank you so much sir uh, that was very inspiring and at the same time we are aware of the busy, busy schedule and everything else that is on your plate at the moment but you've and you've promised us another one hour with us so uh, if there are any questions i request all the viewers uh, listening that please uh, put them in the chat box of the youtube live stream that is happening uh, we would certainly sir uh, we have taken note of all the good initiatives and we would like to be part of that and also encourage everybody to be uh, following uh, all the good work which is happening in the field but having said that we would we must want to acknowledge and uh, respect one of the most uh, world's most renowned uh, field biologists who ever walked uh, this uh, part of the landscape the unknown forests deserts high mountain ranges of this planet which is dr george challer uh, who is uh, with the wcs the wildlife conservation society and he has been kind enough to record a message uh, much uh, in the wee hours of the morning uh, of his uh, home he was Uh, uh he has regretted that he was not uh, available in person but he has recorded a beautiful message uh, for the snow leopard which he studied uh in in those in the era when no one could even think of going to these landscapes and exploring them uh, with such uh, a deep understanding so uh, with this i request uh, uh, the uh, it team to play the recorded message of dr josh shaler that he has kindly consented to give to us for this occasion well i've been very fortunate i went to india first in 1963 and at that time there were two environmentalists known in the country one was don asologist salim ali and the other was epg who was making general wildlife surveys India has increased tremendously in its effort to protect the environment. Uh instead of just one or two people, you've now got dozens of top-notch biologists which I admire. Uh quite a bit of attention has been paid to tigers, of course. There now what is it? 67 tiger reserves and they're most of them are quite well protected. then there are all these environmental organizations in india now that are fighting on behalf of things there were government officials like ranjit singh who worked very hard in getting environmental legislation in the books uh the private people that set land aside uh like arjun singh he set his land aside in effect as a small national park and so you have this tremendous private and government effort which i admire tremendously and i like to go back to india because i see this progress then communities are the ones that will ultimately save their area you have to have community conservation to protect these areas because it's in their long term interest every child needs education by going out into the wilderness because they're so receptive and so there are all these issues that one has to address uh life used to be simple 50 years ago <laughs> this small leopard has become a symbol of the mountain world in asia and that's very important it's a beautiful cat and obviously 
everybody needs to be involved in things, not just uh, the communities need to be involved. Every individual needs to be involved. And naturally, people need to be involved because it's a symbol. The mountain environment helps communities survive by protecting the environment. From the government down to the local level, to outside non-governmental organizations, uh, local universities, everybody really needs to pull together to decide on how best to protect a certain area so everybody benefits. No leopard, if you protect it, protect thousands and thousands of other species in that area. There's no easy solution to anything since constantly everything is changing. Right. Uh, thank you so much. That was the legendary Dr. George Schaller. And truly, as he has mentioned, the snow leopard has become the symbol of uh, high mountain systems in the world. And what better than to hear it from him uh, as he studied them uh, much earlier, much, much earlier, and described them so beautifully in the books that he wrote, including the Stones of Silence. Uh, uh, for uh, And what best to start this webinar with the champion of, of this high mountain landscape who has lived and worked there. And, and for that, I would now like to invite Dr. Charu Dat Mishra, Executive Director of the Snow Leopard Trust and the Senior Scientist with NCF, the Nature Conservation Foundation. Dr. Mishra has more than two decades of experience in research, policy, and community-based conservation related to snow leopards and has been the recipient of several prestigious international awards. Dr. Charu, you have recently run the 24 hours uh, consecutive running to raise the awareness on the health of snow leopards and their habitats. And congratulations uh, for that. It was truly inspiring. And uh, I would now like to invite you to share your presentation titled Taking Stock of Snow Leopards, Human Societies and Planetary Health uh, in a Post-COVID-19 World. Over to you. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sonali. Um, Mr. Das Gupta, distinguished guests, it's an honor for me to be here with all of you today. Um, let me try and get the um, share my presentation. And in a moment, And um, thank you so much, Dr. Sonali Ghosh and Abhishek Ghoshal for thinking about me to, uh, for this lecture. And I know when you um, talked to me, you had wanted me to speak a bit about my own personal journeys in snow leopard research and conservation. And I would have loved to do that at a different time, but I just felt a bit uh, inappropriate to be talking about my own journeys when we are faced with such a huge um, you know, a tragedy of epic proportions around the world because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so I'm very thankful to you for be being flexible and instead allowing me to speak on um, this subject that I have been thinking about for some time now. And I think this subject is also very important, particularly important considering the extraordinary times we find ourselves in. So, um, you know, the Russian revolutionary and political theorist Lenin, um, I was reading recently that this is how he described the Bolshevik revolution, which occurred about 100 years ago. He's supposed to have said that there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are weeks when decades happen. And over the last few weeks to months, decades have indeed happened to us and to um, people around the world ever since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic began. And so I basically, while our you know, healthcare workers and governments around the world are fighting to help us meet the challenges of the pandemic, I thought that on the eve of this International Snow Leopard Day, 
it might be actually pertinent for us to ask ourselves to what extent snow leopards and their ecosystems are safe from the risk of uh, potential diseases. And when I say snow leopard ecosystems, I talk about snow leopards, but also the other host of other an, uh, animals and birds that share their habitats. But also very importantly, the local communities that Mr. Dasgupta mentioned, that uh, Dr. Shala mentioned um, about the, you know, the, the importance of taking local communities along and protecting their interests when we're talking about snow leopard conservation. So there's a lot of questions that are uh, facing us today. Are snow leopards and their ecosystems safe? How safe are local human communities? How can we make sure that we don't get surprised in the future like we got surprised with the COVID-19 pandemic? How can we make sure that we don't get surprised uh, by such um, outbreaks in the future? And whose responsibility is it? And I definitely don't claim to have the answers, but I thought that today is a good occasion to at least begin to ask those questions of ourselves. And you know, as, as uh, people in our audience, everyone who's interested in conservation, my hope is that we sort of begin to ask ourselves these questions um, through, my, uh, through this um, presentation today. And so looking at the past is always, um, always uh, useful and insightful because history can be uh, quite uh, revealing and insightful. So what I, you see uh, here is a, a figure that depicts the, the pandemics that humans have faced uh, over history. You know, and the, this is sort of starting from the left side, which is at about 100 AD, to the right corner, which is about the current year, 2020. And uh, the circles that you see are actually uh, the estimated human mortality caused by those pandemics. And the last thing I want to do is to sort of reduce this, you know, tragedies of these immense proportions into a statistic. That's not my intention, but I think that this figure is revealing uh, in its own way. And there's a few important things that we can learn from. It. Now, firstly, I'd like you like to draw your attention to the right hand bottom right corner of this figure where you see a circle that represents the loss of human lives because of the COVID-19 pandemic. It's still a growing circle, but uh, you know, because this is uh, the effects are still unfolding. Uh, and, uh, but what, what this graph is showing us, what, what this is showing us compared that to some of the other larger circles that have uh, occurred in during human history. And what it is essentially telling us that for all of us, all of us, uh, you know, who are listening here today, you and I, the COVID-19 pandemic, we've never faced anything like this in our lifetimes. But if we look at not even very old, but even recent human history, humans have been impacted by such tragedies and even bigger tragedies. I mean, let's take the Spanish flu for, uh, for uh, as an example, the, the, the large gray circle that you see on your screens on the right side. And the Spanish flu, it again, uh, you know, it was a pandemic that happened around the time of the Bolshevik Revolution, 100 years ago, around uh, during the First World War. This pandemic is thought to have infected 500 million people around the world, and you know, which was about a third of humanity at that time. And it is supposed to have caused a loss of 50 million or more human lives. So it's, it's been really, really huge. And so the, the point uh, here is that, you know, we have been facing, humans have been facing these tra tragedies over historical times, and yet we found ourselves somewhat un unprepared to deal with the current pandemic. There's a couple of other important messages from this uh, figure. Well, uh, before um, I move to those, let me also uh, mention that uh, the Spanish flu was actually caused by a group of viruses that is rather familiar, the H1N1, which we know, you know, that's the same family of viruses that has caused the recent swine flu pandemic. And so the Spanish flu is thought to have originated in birds, moved on to pigs, and then jumped from pigs to humans. And as we all know, it's a process called zoonosis when these pathogens jump from animals to humans. And uh, so the other th thing that you see in this graph is most of the pandemics in human history have been uh, zoonotic. You know, you, there's very few black circles that you see. Most of them 
uh, that you see are gray in color, which uh, represents the zoonotic diseases. It's jumped from, and uh, the pathogens have actually jumped from animal host to human host. And so this is a um, rather important issue to keep in mind, simply because the what it's telling us is that you know animal health and human health are very closely linked. The other thing that is important to look at in this figure is that you see a lot of clustering on the right side of the screen. And what that is telling us is that actually the frequency of known pandemics is on the increase. Um, so these are several of these, you know, just looking at a simple figure is able to tell us that we really need to be concerned about disease outbreaks. And indeed, the Emerging infectious diseases, the diseases that have emerged over the last few decades and are still evolving. I think emerging infectious diseases are one of the biggest challenges that humanity faces today. And the other thing to remember is that over 75% of the emerging infectious diseases are thought to be zoonotic, that they have come from animals uh, to humans. So let's uh, look uh, now, you know, after this a bit of a background, let's look at what is happening in snow leopard landscapes or this region of South and Central Asia that I sort of broadly term as High Asia. Now, this is this huge region of more than maybe six million square kilometers of contiguous connected mountains and high plateaus um, across this large landmass of Asia. And the parts that you see in color are the mountain ranges that represent the range of the snow leopard. So the snow leopard range is thought to be between one to two million square kilometers in this larger high Asian region. And because the conditions are so similar across high Asia, the ecological conditions, I thought we should focus on snow leopard range, but also on more broadly on high Asia. Now, these are relatively dry and arid and very cold landscapes, high Asian landscapes. And that has led to this thinking and this belief that you know life is hard. Life is hard. As we all know, life is hard in the in these high mountains. And therefore, it is also thought that life is hard for pathogens as well. Disease transmissions are not very easy. So these high mountains are thought to have relatively lower diversity and abundance of pathogens. And of course, they're relatively remotely populated, be it human populations, they are more sparsely distributed, even wildlife populations tend to be lower. And these are the factors that actually reduce the risk of disease emergence and transmission in these landscapes. But at the same time, the flip side to it is that if it is indeed true that you have low pathogen diversity and abundance, what it might also mean is that the basic inherent levels of immunity in humans and in, in animals might also be lower simply because there's not been enough opportunities over evolutionary time for these host um, pathogen relationships to evolve. So, you know, there are factors that sort of reduce the risk of disease in high mountains for snow leopards and for the ecosystem, but there are also inherent factors that tend to increase this um, a little bit. So now let's look at what the actual data tell us. Now this figure from Jones et al. is basically depicting the, um, the points, the, the known in emergence of infectious disease, emerging infectious diseases, so relatively recent emergence of diseases around the world. And one, the important thing that I want to point out here uh, that is that if you look at the high Asian landscape, there's almost no emergence of, you know, the new emerging infectious diseases, known emerging infectious diseases in high Asia, which seems to be good news for us and for snow leopards. Now, let's look at what is thought for the future, the future projections in terms of potential disease outbreaks. So, you know, people do, epidemiologists do these future uh, projections for and uh, disease modeling. And here, you know, um, the, here's a map by Alan et al., which is actually showing the global risk, the future risk of uh, potential emergence of zoonotic diseases, zoonotic emerging infectious diseases that jump from animals to humans, humans, excuse me. And here again, what you see is that the high Asian region is comes up as relatively low risk. And this is what you see, this is one example. But if you look at all the sort of the, um, the models of disease risk, the high Asian re region comes up as a low risk area. Most of the you know, high risk areas are in South and Southeast Asia, uh, Central Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa, 
parts of uh, Central America <clears throat> and smaller parts of uh, North and South America. So again, you know, from the perspective of high Asia, from the perspective of snow leopard landscapes, the, uh, the disease models at least predict um, relatively low risk here. Now, like us to do a bit of a, you know, help uh, do a bit of a deep dive into this and to see to what extent this might actually be the case, that uh, the risk is um, actually low. Now, I started thinking about disease related issues when we started at the Snow Leopard Trust and our partners, we started thinking about these issues around around 2012. So some of you might know that we have one of the most comprehensive long term ecological studies um, of snow leopards anywhere to be conducted. This is the 12th year running of the study. Uh, it's being done uh, in South Kobe of Mongolia together with our Mongolia partners. And amongst other things, this is a population of snow leopards that has been monitored continuously uh, through camera trapping over these years. And also, uh, you know, one of the other important aspects of this long term study has been radio well, GPS coloring of snow leopards and um, and continuously. So we've been able to so far uh, color um, 32 snow leopards across generations. And so all this sort of close monitoring has given us the ability to be able to track the fate of individual snow leopards rather closely. And in around 2010 and 2011, within a short uh, span of a few months, our team actually found uh, four uh, dead snow leopards, four carcasses of snow leopards at different locations. And those carcasses did not show any um, uh, strong visible signs of any injury. And we, that got us thinking about whether disease actually might be playing a role in influencing snow leopard populations. And that led us to start uh, some research on uh, disease. And before I move to the results, or uh, the, some of the, summarize some of the results of those studies, um, there was also ecological information that we were generating that made us think that, hey, maybe this is something which is rather important for snow, could be rather important for snow leopards. Now, as we know, there are factors, like I've mentioned, some of them that reduce the risk of disease in these landscapes, like possibly low pathogen abundance and diversity. The populations, like I said, of, wild, um, of wildlife in general tend to be low, and snow leopards are also believed to be solitary outside of the breeding season, outside the mating season. But as we were collecting the, doing the other ecological information that was coming out, what we, it was also, to, uh, becoming apparent that they seem to have much larger home ranges than what we had previously believed. And there's pretty much they move long distances, which means that, you know, they, they, these, these factors generally tend to increase the risk of disease transmission. The other important finding has been that the, um, you know, they're not as solitary as we, of course, they're solitary animals, but adults seem to, they do interact outside of the breeding season again. And I'm not just talking about aggressive interactions. The, um, there are uh, periodic interactions. We found radio collared adults, uh, individuals interacting with each other, spending time to get, uh, some time together before moving uh, apart again outside of the breeding season. So there are much many, many more interactions amongst adults. And the, the other important thing is that snow leopards have a much later age. Turns out snow leopards in the wild have much later age at first breeding and relatively long interbirth inter intervals when we compare them to other large uh, felids. And of course, you know, they may be sort of, they might interact and, they, but they're relatively solitary, but their prey are not, you know, the prey are gregarious, herd living, uh, migratory, some of them. And these uh, areas also have a lot of livestock, uh, which I'll uh, come to a bit later again. And so all these factors potentially increase the risk of um, disease emergence and transmission. Now, what did we find? You know, so some of the, the uh, our teams published uh, a few papers in the last uh, few years on uh, disease. And one of the things that, of course, the data set is limited, the sample sizes, even though we've had a relatively large, large number of radio colored individuals, but you know, when it comes to disease kind of analysis, the sample size is still being limited. But based on the analysis of um, uh, the uh, samples that we did have, we actually were able to report a number of bacterial viral uh, diseases in wild snow leopards, as well as some, you know, there are some bacterial and viral diseases that they're 
parasites were carrying. And most of these are zoonotic, uh, all these are the ones that I've listed are zoonotic. They can, they also uh, affect humans. They have come from animals, but they affect humans as well. And in most cases, well, they have uh, sublethal effects, but they do cause morbidity. But it's not just snow leopards. We were also, our team was also looking at the other species that um, that uh, occur in these habitats. You know, there are other carnivores, there's uh, dogs, feral dogs, etc., herding dogs, and, uh, you know, rodents, etc., wild ungulates. And together with our own results, as well as when we look at the other studies that have been done in on disease in South and Central Asia, you actually find a host of other pathogens which are already existing in this system. And they actually include some very um, lethal, you know, uh, the pathogens that can he have lethal effects, including on humans, such as, you know, anthrax and plague and rabies, etc. So the, the main point that I'm trying to make here is that some of these very significant zoonotic pathogens are already there in the system, in the high Asian system. So one of the basic conditions of, you know, the the potential for disease emergence and transmission uh, is already there, you know. Uh, so, so this is something uh, to really sort of keep in mind. Now, let's look at this system a little bit more closely. Now, like I have mentioned, that snow leopard ecosystems, which have snow leopards and all these other host of animal and bird species, uh, which are interacting with each, other, with each other, and they also already have these pathogens in the system. Now, there's a lot of local level factors and i'm talking about uh, this uh, more on a range wide level not specifically about one area or the other even though our studies had largely been restricted to the Tos mountains of mongolia but now i'm trying to make a general point that there's a lot of um, local factors that increase the risk of potential disease emergence and transmission uh, in these landscapes i've mentioned a couple of them already presumably low levels of immunity um, the uh, existing prevalence of pathogens that are there already. Like elsewhere, like in other ecosystems, there is habitat degradation and loss of uh, wildlife populations, reduction in wildlife populations. I will not go into the reasons why, and, and there's multitude of threats, but this is not the place to talk about them. And we, we know from other areas, we know from tropics and other, where much more disease research has been done, that the possibility of the spread of disease and even zoonosis increases with habitat degradation, with pollution that can compromise um, uh, uh, immunity, immunological systems, and uh, also with the reduction in wildlife populations when, when pathogens often tend to jump to other hosts, including humans. Um, there is evidence, if you look at it globally, there is evidence across the range of increasing levels of uh, poaching and Ill illegal wildlife trade as well. And uh, in these areas, there is a lot of consumption and use of wildlife as well in, um, by people as well as, you know, for medicinal purposes. So and these are like, you know, um, conditions that can really uh, increase the chances of um, disease outbreaks and potential zoonosis. Um, there's these the entire high Asian ecosystem, particularly snow leopard landscapes. These are rangeland systems where you know for millennia people and their livestock and the wildlife have lived very closely to each other, and you know they they share their water sources, they share pastures. So they, those are conditions that sort of uh, are relative increase the risk of disease transmissions from uh, animals to humans, zoonosis, but also anthroponosis, the reverse zoonosis as well. And the more the sort of ecological resilience of any ecosystem, the more that is weakened, the greater are the chances that the pathogens can uh, jump and switch hosts. There's a lot of um, socio local socioeconomic changes that are going on in these landscapes as well, which again sort of tend to increase the um, the potential for the risk of disease transmissions and uh, disease emergence um, amongst, uh, you know, like Mr. Dasgupta also talked about the um, not, you know, that these areas have not had enough of conservation. You know, it's hard for the uh, conservation staff, the protection staff to work in these areas. And similarly, with other public services as well, high mountains have generally been, I mean, they, they've generally been marginal, they're remote, difficult areas, sparse populations, so then really not in the mainstream. So definitely, even in terms of the public health infrastructure, 
the the animal health infrastructure and so on those areas tend to be relatively weak now we these ecosystems uh, snow leopards like we've seen don't exist in isolation so you have the snow leopards and other species and their pathogens plus for millennia we've had we've had humans living in these landscapes and with humans of course there are human pathogens livestock and livestock pathogens that are part of this system and the main concern is that with more greater changes in their habitats and with degradation the the risk of disease transmissions between these various groups can increase and on top of that of course there are these global drivers these are not local drivers but these are global drivers such as you know globalization we live in a globalized world there's unprecedented levels of movements of goods and people between high mountain landscapes between high asia and other parts of the world uh, there's so much uh, uh, exchange of humans commodities kashmir is a, has for example a big commodity from these landscapes which has a global market etc so you know the, so so there's a, so much of this movement of goods and people and therefore presumably of pathogens as well global warming is a critical issue you know these high mountain areas these snow leopard ranges are believed to be actually warming at twice the average rates as compared to the uh, levels of warming in the northern hemisphere so these again as the as the climate warms this basically in sort of increases the risk you know, alters host pathogen relations and increase the risk of potential um, future disease outbreaks uh, the the uh, mass mortality of saiga is a perfect example of how weather anomalies have actually led to this uh, bacterial infection which ca causes uh, hemorrhagic septicemia in saiga and has led to tens of thousands of saiga deaths over a short period of time and then um, wildlife trade i mean i also talk about it as a global driver because as we all know there are global networks um, uh, for wildlife trade so it is a global issue as well and basically the point that i'm trying to make here is that together these factors actually some inherent factors but some of these changes conspire um, to create conditions for potential disease outbreaks in the future potential zoonosis and reverse um, zoonosis as well is called, called anthroponosis so the, the, we have to this is a bit of a wake up call not all of this is based on evidence a lot of this is so that's why i've called it a conceptual model but this is really to get ourselves start thinking and get better prepared for the future so that we do not surprise ourselves and so that snow leopards their ecosystems and uh, humans too can have a in high mountains can have a secure future from a disease perspective whose problem is this is it a local problem is it uh, do we expect say, state governments to solve it is it a national problem like you know um, um uh, where you know state governments and national governments have to be work together or is it a, is it a global issue and this is all my my sort of uh, thinking about this and uh, so bear with me let's look at these ecosystems once more mr das gupta talked about ecosystem services and you know talked about water and you know how uh, the rivers originating in these mountains in the himalayas are sources of water for so many people uh, that is true for india but it's also true pretty much for across asia and these water towers as mr das gupta called them they are basically providing clean water to half of humanity it's not just clean water and i don't want to steal ranjini's thunder ranjini is going to be talking much more in detail about ecosystem services but i think suffice it would suffice here to say that you know there's in terms of ecosystem services uh, in terms of clean water clean air carbon sequestration a whole bunch of other um uh, provisioning ecosystem services they do not only have local benefits but they have global benefits as well the second important thing is it obviously has the snow leopard and it has a lot of other species of global conservation importance not just national or local and if if anything if covid uh, 19 pandemic has taught us anything it has taught us that healthcare is not a local or even a national issue it is a global issue and when i talk about healthcare and we are talking about not just human health but also animal health and the health of our wildlife populations so we live in a globalized world and i we i personally think that this is a the benefits of conserving conserving the snow leopard ecosystems the conserving the high asian ecosystems i think it has global benefits 
and therefore the responsibility is i would believe is also global about doing something about it so we don't surprise ourselves so what can we do about it and you know this is i would like to end with this and once again one of the most important things i think that needs to be done is landscape level spatial planning for not just conservation but for development as well for economic development and i'm not just talking about livelihoods securing and strengthening local communities livelihoods is critical but i'm talking about economic development in general i think with conservation we are in such landscapes we have been much better at landscape level planning but not so much perhaps with economic development green development now i know that's a loaded and a tends to be a vague term but what the point i would like to make here is that um, you know the post industrial revolution uh, uh, model of economic development which is like completely based on economies of scale and unsustainable exploitation of natural resources that is just not suitable for these high mountain lands so perhaps you know one could argue it's not suitable for other uh, places as well but definitely not for high mountain landscapes that the snow leopards inhabit and we are already seeing effects of um, this kind of unsustainable growth in terms of extreme climatic events natural disasters in the mountains but we still have a chance to and the uh, great need to um, sort of nudge the course of economic development into something which is a bit different from the uh, from the model of economic development that has been followed elsewhere in the world but something that focuses of course on inclusive growth of local communities but also that something that is focusing on more sustainable industries that are less damaging to the environment and like i said uh, spatial uh, coordinated spatial planning between conservation and economic development is absolutely critical if these mountains have to have a chance illegal wildlife trade i mean again um, i don't have to say much but just to say that it is not just a law enforcement problem it's a huge law enforcement problem of course that national governments are making this effort and you know there are also international the cooperation between governments and those are absolutely required to break those trade networks but at the same time even conservationists like uh, us have a role in this i believe and which is really to help reduce the consumption and demand for wildlife through more sustained um, efforts at uh, outreach and awareness and i'm really happy that uh, you know the at least some of this what i have talked about is basically already recognized at least where i think we need to do be doing much more but they are recognized as being priority areas in the, by the global snow leopard ecosystem protection program uh, some of you are aware of it it is a high level intergovernmental um Uh, 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 cooperation platform uh, of all snow leopard range countries and represented by their environment ministers or their de designates uh, government of india has been playing an important role in that program as well and that program uh, actually already identifies some of these as priority though there's much more work to be done of course but one of the things that if we have learned anything from the ongoing pandemic is that this program must moving forward prioritize also issues of um uh, healthcare and when i say healthcare it's not just strengthening you know public health services for humans in these landscapes is absolutely critical but uh, for animals and you know promoting greater disease uh research as well as surveillance surveillance and monitoring programs uh, for disease in these high landscapes and that's because it is going to have not just it's not just important for protecting these ecosystems but as we've seen it's also important for securing global health and well-being of humans around the world and not just of animals so i'd like to really end here personally by basically reiterating this point that for far too long think conservation economic development healthcare some of, and for some of these issues have been looked at from very as being parts of very different and separate policy realms and often at loggerheads with each other and those i believe you know we cannot afford to have those divisions anymore and we what we is really needed in the future is much better combined strategies to um, to tackle to plan for economic development to plan for conservation uh, to plan better plan for healthcare in a much more sort of integrated manner and which is really i mean i think it's critical for the survival of snow leopards and the magnificent other wildlife that live in these landscapes as it is for human well-being 
So thank you so much. I before I just uh, uh, let go. I just want to quickly acknowledge that these are ideas I've not been working on in isolation, but it's a team of international team of people. We've been working closely on some of these aspects. Uh, Dr. Carol Eason did, is a veterinary doctor and she did her PhD on disease in snow leopards. Dr. Dennis Prashant, who was a human doctor and a public health specialist, did his PhD in public health. Uh, Dr. Max Lowe, who is uh, again a veterinary doctor, uh, but also a conservation ecologist and a modeler. Dr. Gustav Samelia, senior conservation scientist with the Snow Leopard Trust. Dr. Suri Venkatachalam, who is uh, who's an entrepreneur, a scientist and an advisor, senior advisor. Uh, Munib Khaniari, who is a PhD student working on um, uh, disease ecology in high Asia and Dr. Orian Johansson, again, a senior conservation scientist with the Snow Leopard Trust. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. And thanks, everyone, for listening in. Thank you so much, sir. That was uh, extremely useful and very comprehensive. And of course, timely also, as we all are trying to find uh, solutions, grappling with the ideas of how best to address the situation that we are in. And uh, in a way, it was very apt because you have discussed the drivers of change and all the complex ecological environmental conditions that have led to uh, this hypothetical uh, or for that matter, even this more evident uh, situation that we all are in, in terms of the zoonotic or uh, transmission of uh, the diseases. So thank you so much, sir. And it's, it's important that we come up with a holistic plan. Please stay on with us. Uh, if there are questions, we'll take them in the end. I will request Dr. Ranjani Murli now, a conservation scientist, Snow Leopard Trust, to uh, please share her presentation. I am happy to and an honor to introduce her. Uh, Dr. Ranjani Murli has uh, been working in this uh, landscape for more than 10 years. Uh, she has worked on Snow Leopard, and she assists the Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Protection GSLEP program and is also the fellow of IPBS, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Ecosystem Services and Biodiversity. Uh, Ranjani is arguably the first researcher to assess uh, ecosystem services in the snow leopard habitat. And it would be indeed interesting now to understand from Ranjani as to what uh, is uh, uh, what matters and why. That's a title of the talk and a personal account of grappling with ecosystem services in the high mountains. Uh, thank you so much for the wonderful uh, introduction, Dr. Gersh. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to all the fellow members on my panel, uh, Mr. Das Gupta, Charu, uh, Abhishek, and uh, Dr. Gersh. Thank you so much for thinking of me for this panel. I'm really honored to be here. And um, so I'd like to... I'm just going to start my uh, presentation. Sorry. Sorry, can you see my screen? Yes, uh, yes, about two. I think it's not yet visible. Yes, now we can. You can make it full screen, please. Yeah. Uh, can you see my? Sorry, I... Yes, yes. Okay. Ah, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'm just... Uh... Okay, so uh, thank you so much for inviting me here, and I'm really uh, honored to be speaking today. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about my journey, understanding ecosystem services. This is what I studied for my PhD. And after that, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about, uh, Charu actually mentioned it uh, towards the end of his presentation, about the green development projects that the Snow Leopard Trust has been developing. Uh, so what is value? How can we express value? What is the value of nature to people? And can we express the value of nature in monetary terms? 
these are some of the questions that I have been grappling with uh, during my PhD. At the heart of my PhD, I was trying to understand what was the importance or what was the value of nature for people living in snow leopard landscapes. And to answer this, I uh, tried using the ecosystem services framework. And this framework, uh, ecosystem services, uh, Charu has mentioned as his, uh, as his ADG store. So essentially, what the ecosystem services framework tries to do is it breaks up the different ways that nature contributes to people. And using these different components, it tries to place a value on how, on how nature is important for people. And often this value is in one two terms. In fact, the way this ecosystem services concept started was by uh, valuation in monetary terms. And since then, it has moved uh, forward. Uh, ecosystem services can be defined as the benefits that people derive from nature. This is um, a definition from the Common International Classification of Ecosystem Services. And um, there are several uh, definitions, and this is the definition that I use as is the classification from uh, CICES. So according to CICES, there are three kinds of ecosystem services, provisioning, regulating, and cultural. So provisioning services are services like, you know, uh, any of the uh, material benefits that you get from nature. So things like firewood, water, in fact, like some snow leopard landscape, like both uh, uh, ADT sir and Sharu were saying, if the water towers of the world, you know, like 40% uh, almost of the uh, world depend of, uh, or depends on water from high, uh, from the high mountains in Asia. Regulating services, this refers to the services that as the ecosystem regulates itself as a benefit, people get services. So uh, things like pollination, pest control, first prevention, a lot of attention, especially now, and as Saru is also a uh, And then, of course, cultural services. So, cultural services are, uh, are the non material benefits that people get from ecosystems. So, uh, you know, things like bird watching or uh, sacred spaces. This is all of this is based on um, our relationships as well with the natural world. So, for my PhD, I was trying to understand how important nature in a snow leopard landscape was to people. So to do this, uh, there were two sites in India that I was looking at, among other sites, but today I'll be talking about the two sites in India. And I was looking at Spiti Valley in Himachal Pradesh and the Changtang in Ladakh. So in Spiti Valley, across snow leopard landscapes, most people are either agrofastless or pastless, and you know, uh, people share space with uh, snow leopards across snow leopard landscapes. And in uh, Spiti Valley, they're primarily agro -pastulous. And in uh, the Changtang, they're both, they're, you can find both agro as well as pastoralists. So in these three regions, I was, I mean, in both these regions, I was looking at these three communities. Two uh, agro communities and one uh, pastoral community. And to identify uh, ecosystem services, I primarily did it through interviews by, you know, both structured, unstructured interviews, focusing discussion, uh, talking to and spending time with people uh, in this landscape. So what we found was that there was a range of ecosystem services uh, from, that were perceived by people from these landscapes. So you have provisioning services where you have wild plants, forage, water, firewood. You had regulating services, things like climate change, disease control. Cultural services like tourism, places, sense of peace, cultural heritage. And all of these contributed to different aspects of human well being, such as adequate health, sufficient nutritious food, shelter, you know, access to clean water. So, all of this, in some way, like even entire human well being in the landscape, was very dependent on ecosystem services. We were interested in putting a kind of you know, to identify how valuable is it, we thought we would put a monetary value on these services from ecosystem, so, uh, from uh, snow leopard landscape. To do that, we were looking at primarily the provisioning services. So here I was looking at medicinal plants, forage, uh, crop production related ecosystem services, water, wild plants, and energy sources like animal dung and firewood. Uh, we, I would have liked to look at regulating services, but 
there was too much, um, you know, you need a lot of uh, long-term ecological data uh, to look uh, at regulating services. In addition to that, there was not enough, um, you know, the, uh, the global data set, the resolution was not uh, enough for the size of the area I was looking at. So we couldn't look at regulating services. And of course, cultural services, it didn't make sense to put a monetary value on cultural services. Because how can you uh, say, you know, something like sacred space or sense of place, how can you put a monetary value on that? So that didn't make so much sense. So we primarily focused on uh, provisioning services. So what we found was that the services ranged from 3,964 USD to 79,303 USD per household per year. So what does this mean? It's essentially ranged. So if you look at Spiti and Changtang, uh, the agrofastral system, the values here between 3.7 to 2.9 times the annual household income. And if you look at Changtang, the pastoral system, it was close to three times the annual household income. So this is a huge amount that uh, nature was subsidizing lively plants and people were heavily reliant on ecosystem services. Uh, the other interesting point that we found, which actually I didn't expect at all, was that pastoral systems were so much more reliant on uh, ecosystem services than agro systems. And um, this is, we were looking primarily only at provisioning services over here. So this was a really surprising finding uh, for me. So this was not what we expected, this huge difference on the reliance of ecosystem services. We want to look a little bit further to see what it meant for uh, the pastoral system. So, you know, what is the, so Pashmina is the main output from the pastoral system in the Changtang, right? So here we have a, on the picture, there's, a, I'm helping with uh, pulling out Pashmina, which is the main undergrowth of the wool of the Pashmina goat. And it's quite a laborious process to uh, pull it out. Uh, when we looked at, the, we want to, know how much ecosystem service input went into the production of one kg of pashmina. So to put it into context, one kg of pashmina is sold for approximately 2,500 rupees, and of course this varies. Uh, and if we look at the ES input, right, so as ecosystem service input, we were looking at, uh, so six goats approximately taken to producing one kg. So we looked at the amount of water and or uh, fodder that six goats needed for a year, right? So approximately that the value was 36,500 rupees per year. Okay. That's the ES input into Pashu for one kg. So it's almost 4.6 times the price of Pashmina. So again, here we see that ecosystem services are heavily subsidizing not only livelihood, but even just the price of Pashmina, because Pashmina gets sold uh, lower down the chain and all of us are, but this is heavily subsidized by ecosystem services from these high uh, mountain landscapes. So what essentially mo putting a monetary on this helped us understand was it helped us to quantify the extent of dependence on uh, ecosystem services in this landscape. But monetary valuation actually has always made me feel extremely uncomfortable. And it's something that I have really struggled with throughout my PhD because I was like, how can you put a monetary value on something as beautiful as a snow leopard or even just these landscapes? Because I always felt it took away from nature, you know, and it made it something that was completely transactionary and it uh, failed to take into the intrinsic values of nature, like nature probably should exist outside of people. And placing this monetary value maybe already also made it seem that nature was replaceable and it was fungible, right? So if if this uh, these goats are eating this much sheep and if these goats are eating this much water and grass, uh, maybe we can just replace it with fodder from uh, uh, elsewhere and they it would be okay. So these ma questions made me feel really uncomfortable. Uh, but I wasn't alone. 
in feeling uncomfortable about ecosystem services because literature has also been heavily critiqued uh, critical about uh, ecosystem services because they said it promoted an anthropocentric view of nature it promoted an exploitative human nature relationships there was too much of a focus on monetary valuation and you know it was there was a commodification of nature this was some of the critiques that uh, was happening around uh, ecosystem services at the time that i was also studying it and it comforted me a little bit because other people were also struggling with these questions uh, on the flip side by not people were saying that nature implicitly gets valued and because the trade offs and decisions happen all the time and without explicitly stating the value of nature these decisions are happening without taking into its true account of what the value is so that was some de uh, defenses for monetary value of ecosystem services however a lot of the other uh, conversation like you know does this actually capture human nature relationships and perhaps there are other kinds of values pushed the framework into talking about this concept called relational values and relational values are primarily based on the relationships that people have with nature looks beyond just monetary value and it looks beyond just using nature uh, for a human end but rather it looks at the kinds of different complex relationships that people have with nature it also tries to um, now to try to quantify this can get quite complicated so they were trying to value it in different ways and the valuation they call socio cultural valuation so you are still trying to say how important uh, things are to people and there are different ways of doing it and uh, it's been evolving also since i worked on it about 5 years ago so uh, what i did to try to identify uh, values re the relational values that people have because this was a concept that i really identified with and i found um, useful in trying to describe human nature relationships uh, what i did was i tried to look at what are the ecosystem services that people in uh, snow leopard landscapes thought were important to them so based on our previous conversations we had a list of ecosystem and services we had about 25 which uh, i gave to different uh, people and i asked them to rate according to what they found was important and what they found was not important to them so according to this on the left hand side you have the services that they said were the most important to them so things like water for human use climate regulation which is unsurprising because uh, these places are experiencing climate change uh, you know is they experiencing it now and they can feel it so climate regulation was extremely important cultural heritage water for agriculture animal dung uh the last five which were the least important were things like medicinal plants firewood wild plants for food pollination and wild animals and for me this was uh, really surprising like looking at wild animals <laughs> because and this actually was also very telling because for me i even started this entire talk talking about snow leopard landscapes that wild animals here actually refers to snow leopards and prey species primarily and for me that was what was the most important thing in this landscape i started every conversation by talking about wild animals started every conversation by talking about snow leopards but for people in this landscape that was the least important in fact when we uh, come to wild animals they'd be like keep it far away keep it far away the only thing it brings us is loss and that was a really revealing exercise for me because it made me realize that people actually look at nature in different ways and people have different values for nature and nature is much more than you know just the wild it, it's made up of these different uh, complex components that come up to make it and different people have different ways of relating to nature so this exercise personally was very useful for me um and then of course we want to see if uh, you know if monetary value actually captured uh, all value for nature so what we were trying to look at was we looked at uh, these were what we have here on the left uh, uh, on the y axis you have the non monetary value of nature what i showed you before and on the right on the x axis you have the log of the monetary value 
And here we we could only look at provisioning services because we hadn't looked at the monetary value for regulating and cultural services. So what we find here, for example, is if you look at the no if you look at water, it has a very high non-monetary value, but a very low monetary value, right? And then on the other hand, if you look at uh, medicinal plants, it also has you know it's somewhere in the middle. So monetary value itself did not capture all value that people had for uh, nature in this landscape. So uh, overall, looking at ecosystem services, personally for me, there were two uh, important points that uh, came up. So firstly, understanding the, uh, the huge benefits that people were getting from nature and recognizing the centrality of nature to human well-being was uh, very interesting. Quantifying it paid a, a placed a rough estimate on the economic value of nature, and the and here the numbers that we have are actually just provisioning services. So if we were to include even regulating services, the values would be much much higher. Secondly, when I started entering this landscape. I had a very fixed idea of what nature is and what it composed of, which was primarily uh, animals, it was wild, it was, you know, it was beautiful. They were, it was a very fixed idea. But uh, dealing with these uh, questions of value, looking at how other people were valuing nature in this landscape, I realized my idea of nature was very fixed and people actually had multiple values for nature and people had different kinds of values. Uh, and this was a very important uh, recognition for me to recognize that my idea of nature came from somewhere and it was pretty fixed and it differed from uh, other communities and other people's ideas of nature. So these were two important learning lessons that uh, I had while working on uh, ecosystem services in this landscape. So the next thing we were thinking of is can these ideas of nature and multiple values help frame development paradigms? Can nature be central to development? So the Snow Leopard Trust has been working on a project called the Conservation Led Project. And Charu has actually been central in ideating for this project along with our colleague, Dr. Suri Venkata Chalam. And the team is actually uh, quite big who's working on this. There's many uh, people from the Snow Leopard Trust working on these ideas. And this project doesn't view nature and development as dichotomies, but rather it recognizes that nature is essential for development. And uh, this paradigm, which is the conservation-led development paradigm, is based on five pillars. So you have spatially explicit conservation uh, framework, which sets the boundary conditions for the sustainable utilization of ecosystem services together with species and habitat conservation. So this, uh, the, sp the spatially explicit framework can be described in zones. So you have the critical life zone, which is uh, what, where, which is the best habitats for biodiversity. Then you have the ecosystem service stock zone. So this is not, uh, this is where the ecosystems, this is protected for ecosystem services that people can use. Then you have the ecosystem services harvest zone, and this is the zone that people harvest ecosystem services, and very often it can come from the stock zone. So things like, you know, uh, uh, the origins of water, all of that can be in the stock zone, and you in the harvest zone, you can actually be extracting this. And then you have the economic development zone where most of uh, the economic development activities will be happening. So in this way, we uh, factor in nature into development as a central aspect of development. The second, oh, sorry. Oops, sorry, I have no idea why it became. Uh, no issues. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna okay. stop. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. So the second aspect of this is the ecosystem services focus, which we're going to be, uh, it's a strong ecosystem services focus. Uh, and you have the sustainable enterprise model, which is based on globally and locally viable enterprises and uh, that are economically profitable, but also ecologically sustainable. And it's been driven by cultural and local entrepreneurship. Then you have socioeconomic inclusion, 
across gender, class, and other uh, social divisions. Then you can have, a, of course, and none of this is possible without wide-ranging uh, partnerships that bring together expertise. Because, you know, this is a huge model where we're looking at nature, we're looking at uh, conservation. So you need expertise across the board. So we're looking at expertise in business, uh, science, financial capital, uh, development expertise, and uh, of course, even market linkages. And hopefully all of this comes together to form the conservation-led development paradigm. We have, uh, as a part of this paradigm, we've initiated certain uh, pilot projects. And one of them is the Snow Leopard Friendly Pashmina project, uh, which is actually uh, being done in, Lada in uh, the Changtang in Ladakh. So under this project, Pashmina is produced under sustainable Snow Leopard Friendly conditions. So along with the local, um, along with the local herders and other stakeholders, uh, 15 conditions were identified, which ranged from conditions such as rotational grazing, predator proofing of corrals, or feral dog management. So these are the kind of conditions that were identified as snow leopard friendly. So and the project ownership and vision is driven by the local stakeholders. And one of the key aspects of the project is they wanted to reflect the culture and the identity of Ladakh and, and for it to be a symbol of local pride. So then the Pashmina that comes out of this is sold at uh, a premium at the market. It's not yet uh, being done because right now, uh, but we hope to get to a point where we directly link it to the market. And uh, so that's the idea of it, which eventually will make the whole model also economically profitable for uh, the people in these landscapes. Similar projects we planned across Snow Leopard ranges. So for example, ecotourism in Spiti, beekeeping in Kyrgyzstan, and there's cheese making project in Mongolia. And these are initial projects that we hope to take forward. And finally, through this conservation-led development paradigm, uh, we hope to make nature uh, and and values and multiple values for nature central to the development paradigm. And uh, we want to work towards a vision where both people and snow leopards flourish. So that's the main idea behind the conservation-led development project. So yeah, thank you for your attention. And of course, the CLD project has been done by, especially even the Pashmina project has been led by uh, our team uh, with uh, the Snow Leopard Trust and Nature Conservation Foundation. And the other projects are being done with our other country uh, partners in Mongolia and Kyrgyzstan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ranjini. And that was uh, very fascinating, uh, even more fascinating to learn about your work and that uh, fascinating photographs. I think we have really uh, shot on, uh, you know, overshot the time uh, which was given to us in terms of, uh, uh, you know, one hour. But having said that, maybe, you know, one question each, if you all are happy to answer, uh, we could do that. And so therefore, uh, maybe Dr. Ranjani first with you and we'll go in the reverse order. Uh, so what uh, do you think uh, uh, payment for ecosystem services, the way we think of and uh, which is being prevalent in many areas. Uh, do you think that model is something that can work or or what kind, what do you think it should be done, especially for the landscape that we are looking at in India? Uh, thank you for the very important question, uh, Dr. Sonali. So that's a question. Sorry, I'll try to keep it short. So that's a very fascinating question. And the, uh, it's very difficult to say whether it's a direct yes or no. You know, if payments for ecosystem services is effective or not, there are certain spaces where it can be effective if it's implemented well. And there are other spaces where sometimes it's not as uh, effective. And there's interesting research that's been done actually when they've been looking at, uh, you know, behavioral theory, when they've looked at how, when under payments for ecosystem services, how does that change values and motivations of people? And in certain instances, they've shown that when um, this monetary transaction comes in, it can change the relationship that people have with nature because of this external motivation that is money. And that can very often make it less effective. You know, but then there are other cases where they've shown that when ecosystem services is probably paired along with intrinsic values, 
for uh, nature and other kinds of values along with ecosystem services it can have positive uh, benefits you know so it's it it's quite a mixed bag and um, it's difficult to say directly whether it's uh, useful or not and there's a whole bunch of research that's been looking at it and i would think that it would depend on how the project is implemented and the areas where it's implemented right thank you uh, dr ranjini we'll limit it to that and if there are any more discussions we'll we are happy to mail it to you uh, dr charu uh, very interesting very fascinating again for you and uh, you know for for being one of the greatest uh, conservationists now in the country dr charu how do you plan to bring together all these various departments working differently in silos and uh together do you think that uh, uh, that the wildlife division the wildlife conservation community can work uh with the uh, development community and what do you think as civil society organizations uh, can can be done yeah thank you sonali thanks also for immensely kind words um well, that's a great question and i think that uh, so it's not like a it's not completely new steps to in this direction you know i i think the platform sort of exists uh you know uh, my, mr dasgupta mentioned project snow leopard for example and you know we've you know um, worked closely with the government of india and state governments when project snow leopards was being conceived and conceptualized and so that again you know like like you know our colleague dr yashvir bhatnagar plays this role of trying to bridge these divides these uh, sort of uh, divides between and getting various uh, multiple sectors to work together i think that that's absolutely critical i think there is a uh, including in i mentioned project snow leopard even in the global platform the global snow leopard and ecosystem protection program platform there is increasingly you know this recognition of making this whole approach multi sectoral and so the i think the mindset sort of exists the the critical thing is that the policy i think uh, the the policy realms are just so separate we don't have platforms where you know you forget about policies being uh, developed uh, together but we actually do not have platforms where you know conservationists are always talking to human health specialists on the one hand or even animal health specialists sometimes or the industry i mean conservation and uh, economic development industry that always been at loggerheads generally speaking and i think that conversation must happen even if we have different interests or different um, how do you say um, our immediate focus is different but ultimately the, our interests are perhaps not so different it just the way it pans out it appears like we must be at loggerheads and i really feel that platforms like this need to be created where we are talking as much to um, uh, we are always as conservationists we are just talking to conservationists right we are talking to the uh, forest departments or other conservationists and so on and i think we need to step out we need to step out we need to leave our ivory towers and really engage with the real world and the real world whether we like it or not is the world of markets is the world of economic development and because economic development always always has historically trumped the interests of conservation and therefore rather than always trying to seeing us as you know rivals or whatever i think we need to be engaging much better that's sort of you know what ranjini mentioned um, sonali in terms of some of the examples of what we are trying to do um we really exactly trying to do this we don't know uh, where we will land with it but we are trying to have that dialogue whether it's the you know if you look at the uh, pashmina example it is the government of ladakh it is the farmers cooperative it is the entrepreneurs um uh, companies that are interested we're trying to have those investors we're trying to bring the, them together similarly in uh, countries like kyrgyzstan and mongolia kyrgyzstan in particular we have been working with the government with the parliamentary committee for green development with local farmers with local entrepreneurs so as conservationists i think we need to be doing much more and engaging with these other sections of society and it's only then that uh, that solutions will emerge I, i believe solutions will emerge they will not emerge if we don't try but i believe solutions will emerge and we are trying to take our own small steps and i think that uh, uh, as conservationists i would sort of uh, really appeal that we we basically need to 
broaden our horizons a little bit and engage with people and groups and sections of society who just like we are trying to conserve, they are trying to do what they must. And there is no reason for us not to be talking to each other and working out solutions together. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Charu. Thank you so much sir, for this very positive uh, thoughts. And uh, if, uh, and as always, uh, you know, we have the last word from uh, ADG sir, which is uh, Somitra sir. Uh, sir, if you're there, and I could ask you the final question. Uh, he does get uh, called uh, in into meetings. Yeah. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, thank you so much, sir, for your patient uh, hearing and, and to steer this. Sir, you have been a champion of multilateral environment agreements. You brought into the country uh, some of the best uh, ever uh, international uh, meetings that we have had in the last three, four years, uh, right from the CMS COP to the international RHINO meetings to the GSLEP and everything. So, so you've been a champion of looking beyond India and I think when we talk about snow leopard, we talk about mountain ecosystems, we're also looking at transboundary cooperation, looking at different uh, uh, different departments other than the wildlife field. Uh, so what do you think is the way forward? And how do you think in the coming days, uh, this is going to be taken up, especially with the, the high mountain landscapes and, and the multilateral environment agreements that we have that India will be able to lead uh, in the world, sir. Yeah. Actually, I have got a habit of uh, stating that uh, wildlife conservation cannot be done in isolation. Gone are the days where, you know, a few khaki clad person would move around the forest area and think they are, they are protecting the forest. So wildlife conservation has to be by participation and participation from everybody people who lives close to the protected area, the people who lives in the towns, people who lives in the city, they all have to come together. And it is not only the responsibility of the government uh, to protect and uh, promote wildlife conservation, everybody has to come together. Uh, you know, the platform that uh, uh, Charu was actually mentioning, you know, we need to create those kind of platforms wherein we all come together so that uh, our energies are synchronized and uh, moved a focus towards the direction of wildlife conservation. Then only we will be realizing the importance of wildlife, the ecosystem services uh, that it gives, and uh, whether we will be charging, uh, you know, for the ecosystem services. Everything can be discussed then and there, threadbare. So those days are very much, very close to us. And we, we need to create those platforms to discuss these issues. And uh, similarly, uh, if you extend the same principle internationally, you will find that, as Charu mentioned, that nowadays nothing is called local, you know, and uh, uh, national. It's all global now. And the pandemic has proven that, uh, you know, it can't be such, the, such situation that we have, are facing now can't be stopped in a particular country. Action again has to be synchronized. Action again has to be done internationally. Okay, so now, as I was telling during my remarks that it is an opportunity for our country and we are very proud of our uh, history and the support now that we are getting from the government in wildlife conservation. And uh, this is a great opportunity for us, you know, into the COP presidentship and even uh, the standing committee chairmanship that we have got to take things forward. And uh, I believe, and I uh, try to exhort all others who are in this process to come forward and really give a momentum and uh, show to the entire world that what India is doing. And also, you know, like Charu has expanded the Indian theory to the other international uh, arena. So we can also do that from the government side. We can uh, create a platform for other nations to come and see the, what India is doing and can, you know, replicate the best practices. And we can also, on the other hand, you know, like species like the lion and uh, maybe uh, for uh, the rhinoceros that the South, Southern African countries, are doing, we can also pick up uh, good things uh, from the other countries as a part of the best practices. You know, for all these things, we need to come together. We can't do it in isolation. And as we have just mentioned that it cannot be in silos. We need to cooperate, coordinate and collaborate. 
so that uh, the very objective of wildlife conservation is actually achieved and actually it helps the survival of humankind itself. So this is all I see and uh, we from the ministry, we are trying to do our level best and as I was telling you that we are getting 100% support from not only from the ministers but from the Honorable Prime Minister who is coming forward and giving it a give momentum for uh, the wildlife conservation in the country. And we are just trying to, you know, looking forward so that we can maintain the momentum and take it forward. So this is all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, that is absolutely brilliant. And we have come to the end of the first successful uh, series of the series of the webinar. I, I really thank all my uh, speakers today for sparing this time because uh, uh, it has been a busy day and tomorrow is even busier as we celebrate the International Soul Leopard Day with everybody. Uh, please tune in uh, tomorrow on the same uh, YouTube channel to uh, have the glimpse of this. And we look forward to this dialogue that we have started with the series that we do and, and to our experts as well. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much.